Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode eight of the How to Be Cheeky visual podcast. I'm your host, G. Pay Benito. Last week, some students from the University of Virginia reached out to us because they wanted to do an interview and ask us some questions about how Cheeky came to be. So the group is actually doing their capstone senior project on starting a cocktail mixer business. And we love that idea. They asked some amazing and thorough questions. I moderated the interview and today I'm going to tease out some of the points we thought could use some follow-up and share some resources that either we've used or someone who's trying to start a consumer packaged goods business might need. So I'm going to show you a clip on consumer education and then dive in. The knowledge I'd accumulated over roughly four years of running the business had illuminated for me that there were a host of changes we needed to make over time that we had just deferred saying, we'll address this later when we have more money, when we have our own custom bottle, when we have blah, blah, blah. And I just realized that there's some really critical challenges that we have with the product, consumer education being a huge one. And this is one I would encourage you guys to think about as well, but consumer education, like, since it was really innovative, nobody had nobody sells half full containers of anything most of the time. Just educating any consumer around that and also making it clear that this was a value add, not a negative. Um, those were some of the really, really big critical challenges we had to solve. Awesome. So consumer education. They say that the best ideas are both unexpected and obvious. But what does that actually mean? When it comes to consumer education, it's the preparation of an individual to be capable of making informed decisions when it comes to purchasing products. Now, it doesn't always have to be a challenge, but it's often overlooked. Making it a challenge when products hit the shelves and the creators haven't considered some crucial questions for anticipating the consumer's needs and first impressions of the product. Now, here are some questions you might wanna ask yourself when launching a consumer packaged goods business. Where do you want to sell it? Online, at a farmer's market, on a retail shelf? There's no perfect answer, but depending on where the product is being sold is gonna have a huge impact on how you structure your overall business. Do you need to conduct a shelf life study? Shelf life study? <laughs> Do you need to conduct a shelf life study? Will you be mailing it directly to consumers? How is it gonna travel? Are there other products like yours? How are they being sold? Looking at your competition is a great way to ascertain how much work you're going to have to do to communicate what your product is and how it adds value to your customer's life. If your product is going on a shelf in a store, do you want to make what's called a shelf talker? Basically those little postcards next to the price tags that tell the customer something special about your brand. What sets your product apart from everything else on that shelf? For most businesses, you have a really narrow moment when a customer first engages with your product to connect with them on a personal level and to communicate the value of your product. You need to be able to communicate value in an obvious way on a shelf talker, and if it's in person, basically in one sentence. How are you gonna promote trial of your product is another one. Do you have customer reviews you can showcase somewhere? Are you willing to send samples? Um, can you partner with another business that has a trusted following and do a gift box or a care package? These are all great PR moves. And it can be huge, especially if you're launching something with food and beverage. It can be a lot harder to convince people to try a food product they come across online, as opposed to like a perfume or a necklace. How do you convince people it's worth buying? And how are you gonna build trust with your customers? Now look, I know I just fired a million questions at you and it probably could seem really overwhelming in the beginning, but listen, nobody knows everything before they start. So you don't have to feel like you know all the answers before you start a business. Every single business owner has learned lessons along the way and continues to learn throughout the lifespan of the business. If you don't know the answer, then don't be afraid to reach out just like these University of Virginia students did. Thought they're totally on the right track. You're gonna find that a lot of entrepreneurs are willing to help and want you to succeed. I'm gonna show you another clip on food safety resources and shelf stability how you went from something that was refrigerated to shelf stable, because that's what I'm working with one of the members of my team on in the recipe using uh, heat and then keeping it at a specific temperature and bottling it right away. Um, so we, so that's the hot fail process. That is what mm -hmm. we use. And that is my assumption is like the vast, vast, vast majority of mixers and 
bar syrups and things of, the, of that nature are maybe just to illuminate a challenge with it. Mm -hmm. um, and this is more on the juice side rather than on the syrup side. Um, but there is like, if you, if you do what we decided, which was to not add additives, preservatives, or artificial colors or flavorings, um, there is like heat has a very extreme effect on color. Cool. So shelf stability, food safety, that can turn a lot of people off. Some of us, you know, we're good in the kitchen. People like what we make and we think that should be enough. Now, you don't have to be a food scientist to start a business. In fact, I think most people who start <laughs> consumer packaged good food, snack, juice, cocktail mixer businesses aren't coming from food science backgrounds, but it's definitely something you're gonna wanna consider and look into. So you can seek out and learn from experts and you absolutely must become the expert in your own product shelf stability, food safety, and lifespan. I mean, that's your baby. Anything that happens to it is going to reflect on you and the business. So ask, what is the necessary shelf stability to ensure food safety and if my product works in distribution? This is going to really dramatically affect how the product is sold and where it's sold. Now, I'm going to share my screen with you to show you some resources that we've used and you might want to use. See my amazing uh, design skills. <laughs> so first up, um, something that we've used because it's really conveniently located in New York is the Cornell Food Venture Center. Um, it's located in Ithaca, has a bunch of resources and training in food safety. Uh, not only that, Cornell is also the national leader in juice HACCP training. HACCP stands for hazard analysis and critical control points. These are super, super critical. Juice HACCP certification course um, is a course that will certify someone to be equipped with the knowledge and skills to safely produce juice-based and acidified foods. Cheeky cocktails as a cocktail mixer are um, bottled juices qualify as acidified foods or juice-based, right? Um, another thing is the Online Better Process Control School at the University of Georgia. It fulfills the FDA and USDA requirements to certify supervisors in acidification, thermal processing, and container closure evaluation operations during canning of low acid or acidified foods. Even if it's not in a can, your product might fall into this if it's in a bottle, a glass bottle, something like a jar, right? So you're going to want to look into some of these things. And also, these are just a few of the programs that we've used. However, there are programs like these at universities all over the country. So if you do a Google search, you're going to be surprised there might be something closer to you than you know. And some things like this University of Georgia course is actually offered online. And they also have an online certification for international. Super, super helpful. Next, I'm going to stop my screen share. Here I am. I'm going to show you another video about online communities and incubators to help you get started because, you know, there's product research you want to do, there's food science research you want to do, and sometimes what you might need is really some people skills research to do, or even just to hear from other people and learn from their experiences in sort of the soft skills or personal development that other people have gone through to start their businesses. One of the great blessings of launching Swig and Swallow and then being in the same location that we're in right now um, in the same building in Brooklyn is we launched into a food incubator. And so amongst, or we were basically amongst maybe a hundred other businesses, maybe, maybe fewer, but we were surrounded by this really supportive group of people who were all pursuing a comparable dream. I think from the start, had I, had I been more open to just asking a lot of questions and sharing resources from day one, like really uh, not aggressively, but like actively that would have expedited a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of our process and our progress. Basically, I would look for as many online communities as you can find where you can learn from other entrepreneurs who may be a little bit ahead of you or maybe very far ahead of you. Awesome. So 
maybe not everybody is as open and willing to share about their experiences as we are at Cheeky, but a lot of people are. So don't be discouraged. Don't be shy. We were lucky enough to launch into an incubator. Now, what is an incubator? No, it's not something that hatches a chicken, although it's kind of like that. It hatches a little business. <laughs> um, and who could they be right for? So I'm going to share with you some information. Going back to sharing my screen with you. Sharing my screen. We already talked about that. So food, business, incubators. What do they do? They accelerate small businesses and they can do this in a number of ways. Um, it's generally in the early stages, although some people go into incubators um, and use them as like shared kitchens or what they call ghost kitchens um, if they don't necessarily need to produce their product uh, on a consistent basis. This is um, some really established caterers only need to rent in a shared or a ghost kitchen and they'll work basically a uh, wedding season or something like that. Um, so it depends. You could be alongside a bunch of beginners as well as a lot of seasoned food business entrepreneurs. So food incubators accelerate small businesses in early stages and they can do this by sometimes providing capital investment, more often well-equipped commercial kitchen spaces. This is the stoves, the dish station, the strainers, the big ladles, the big flamey things, well equipped, right? Access to networking classes, packaging and distribution support, huge, and even consulting services. They also, as we mentioned, create communities for entrepreneurs to build camaraderie, learn from each other, and even provide a little healthy competition, very healthy. But remember, beware, some incubators ask you to give up a portion of your business in exchange for investment, and this might not be right for everyone. Mentorship and networking opportunities can be more difficult to find elsewhere, but they can be found elsewhere for free. People do want to help each other out and have a better experience. So as I keep saying, reach out, reach out, reach out. Here are some food business incubators you might not have heard of. Please excuse my uh, choppy cut and paste of these <laughs> logos. I was kind of doing it in a hurry. Um, our students were based in Virginia, so I just did a cursory search for Virginia-based incubators. There's La Cucina, which requires an application. Frontier Kitchen, which just asked for an inquiry and chicken and egg, which asked for a rental application. Um, and they did ask for you to come with insurance. So that's definitely something to look into. Now incubators that exist in other parts of the country are the Chobani incubator, super well known. They definitely ask for an application. Something cool about them is that they don't ask for equity um, or a portion of your business when they provide capital investment and their capital investment is quite significant. There's also Union Kitchen in Washington, D.C., which requires an application. Kitchen Crew, which requested an inquiry. And then the Kirchner Fellowship, which I wanted to include in this because it's really interesting. It's for students who seek to make a meaningful impact on food security and sustainability in a global way. So I thought that was cool. Throw it in there. Um, maybe some students will apply. Now, if you're looking into an incubator or you're thinking about starting a business and you really want to talk to some people, um, we also really recommend joining online communities. So on Facebook, there's hashtag OMG, CPG, and Startup Food Biz. Those are some we know. Um, we also recommend that if there's a business that you like, reach out to them. I mean, find their social media, find their email list. I mean, the students at the university, they got our contact and sent an email. We were happy to reply. I'm sure a lot of other small businesses are going to be super stoked to share their story and pass on some knowledge and information. Another great way to be inspired is to listen to podcasts, How I Built This, TED Business, Mixergy, and Startups for the Rest of Us, to name just a few. Um, and really, the number one thing I want to say is that Put yourself out there, talk to people, use the internet, use social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, what have you. If there's a product you like and it's a snack, chips, something, and it's at your local corner store or deli in the grocery, see if there's a contact on, um, on the bag, on the package, see if there's 
you know, a client PR, somebody, you might even be able to speak directly with the CEO. You might be able to speak with, you know, the team, they might be able to point you to other resources. You never know. So put yourself out there. Don't be shy. A lot of people in entrepreneurial business love to talk and love to share and love to lift each other up. So that's pretty much what I got for y'all today. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, if you have any questions or experience with some of the incubators I mentioned in today's episode, or if you've taken any of the food certification courses, like the ones we've listed or other ones, we'd love to hear about your experiences in the comments. Tell us how it went. How are you using the knowledge and what kinds of businesses you might be building? Cause we want to check you out, continue supporting each other in our entrepreneurial journeys. Let us know. I'm also going to link to a document that includes all of the resources and um, everything that I basically mentioned today in the description. So free toolkit document slides will be available. You can DM comment. Uh, I definitely res respond and read all of them. So thank you so much. I really hope that this was helpful. Good luck to the students at the University of Virginia. We are cheering you on and see you next week for episode nine of the How to Be Cheeky visual podcast. <laughs> Cheers.